Hello everyone, welcome back for one more video in this lecture for proteomics. So at this point we have talked about protein folding, post-translational modifications, specifically in the third video talking about the ubiquitin proteasome system and the need for destroying proteins when they are either not folded correctly or have become non-functional. So in this last video, I just want to quickly discuss a couple of different diseases that are the result of proteins not folding correctly. Now, there certainly are quite a few diseases that we could discuss, but I just picked a couple of them just to kind of focus our attention here. So let's go ahead and see what we got here. So up until this point, we have made the following very important conclusions, right? So number one, we said that proteins in the cell really need to fold very, very quickly after they are made into their native state so that they can get to functioning right away. And when proteins do not fold correctly, uh, if chaperones cannot get the protein to fold correctly, those proteins are going to be targeted for destruction pretty quickly by the proteasome or possibly by autophagy. So what happens if these fail-safes do not work? What happens if the protein misfolds? It can't be destroyed and it really starts to accumulate in the cell. So it actually turns out, as I've been indicating, that several different human diseases are literally caused by the buildup of unfolded and damaged proteins inside of the cell. So first, let's look at the case of Alzheimer's disease. I'm sure you've heard of that one. So this is caused by the accumulation of damaged or misfolded proteins inside cells of the brain. Specifically, the two proteins are called amyloid beta and tau. Tau happens to be a protein that associates with microtubules inside the cell. In either case, when these proteins do not fold correctly, they should, in healthy cells, they should be targeted by the proteasome or by autophagy for degradation so that we spare all the other parts of the cell from having to deal with them. But for reasons that are ultimately still being investigated, these proteins do not end up being destroyed. They accumulate a lot faster than they can be cleared out, and these lead to a lot of the neurological issues that are uh, part and parcel of dealing with Alzheimer's disease. So let's look at a slightly different one called Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is called by a specific kind of mutation to a protein called hun hunting 10. So the spelling of the protein there is actually not a mistake. So the disease and the protein are actually spelled a little bit differently. So Alzheimer's disease, which we just looked at, uh, so researchers are still investigating genetic components to this, but it actually turns out that the vast majority of Alzheimer's cases are, are uh, sporadic, meaning that they don't necessarily have a tried and true genetic component to it. Huntington's disease is 100% a genetic disease. It is caused by a very specific duplication uh, mutation that occurs in the uh, uh, Huntington gene in which we have a codon, uh, CAG, which should code for the amino acid glutamine, that codon gets duplicated again and again and again and again. So instead of having just uh, a handful of glutamine residues that all occur one right after another, we end up with many, many of them, as many as 40, 50, 60, or even more than 70 of them in a row. So that can be a problem based on what we've talked about before about how proteins fold and assume their tertiary structures. So this is obviously going to change the way the protein folds. So the protein, the mutant protein is not going to fold correctly and it's going to end up being resistant to degradation and it's going to cause all kinds of pro, uh, problems inside the cell as we have indicated. So those are just the two specific diseases I wanted to offer up as kind of examples for the general idea of what goes wrong when proteins do not fold correctly and they can't be destroyed. So I just want to uh, focus your attention on the big picture here. What is the general idea of what is going wrong here? So the idea is that when a protein does not fold correctly, it is going to expose hydrophobic patches of amino acid side chains. We've talked before about how when proteins fold correctly, those hydrophobic side chains should be buried at the center of the protein so that they do not have to interact with water. So 
that's the major driving force behind getting a protein to fold correctly. We want to hide those hydrophobic amino acids away. So it stands to reason that when a protein does not fold correctly, these hydrophobic amino acids are not going to be properly hidden. Now, the way chaperones are supposed to work is that chaperones recognize those hydrophobic patches and then do a good job of getting the protein to fold back in a way that we hide those away. So if we do not do a good job of folding the protein and we can't destroy it, you're going to start building up these proteins inside the cell that are all exposing these hydrophobic patches. And what have we learned so far about things that are hydrophobic? They like to conglomerate together. They like to interact with each other so that they can all see each other and hide themselves away from water. So a lot of times when you have a lot of misfolded proteins in the cell, those misfolded proteins all like to stick to each other through hydrophobic interactions. And this creates this big, big aggregate or mass that consists entirely of unfolded proteins. So these big protein aggregates end up being very resistant to degradation by the ubiquitin system because it's like, okay, you can tag those with polyubiquitin, but you're going to have a hard time pulling them away to get them to the proteasome. And then a lot of times these aggregates can accumulate faster than autophagy can deal with them. And obviously it's common sense that the bigger these aggregates get, the more unwieldy they become to encapsulate within an autophagosome and deliver to the lysosome. So these are the basic ideas of how unfolded proteins can cause all kinds of problems inside the cell. So getting a protein to fold correctly, it's not just about preserving its function, it's about sparing the function of other well-folded proteins inside the cell. All right, so that is going to do it for this particular lecture on protein folding. Uh, hope you had a good time, and I will see you the next time around. See you later.